All right, welcome to this episode of Inside Aviation. I'm Kevin. I'm Ryan. And today we'll be covering FAA cracking down on public charter, Boeing hearing in Congress, some 737 incidents, which are all Southwest, and a possible flight attendant strike. Ryan, what's up, man? What uh, yeah, what's up? Welcome back, by the way. How was I know, your uh, little vacay? Your it was European awesome. vacation. It was incredible. Like I, I was, I was talking to somebody else about this. Um, when I'm first over there, like the first few days, I'm like, man, America really needs to loosen up and learn some of these like just values of living life. And then by the end of the trip, I'm like, I am the most patriotic person ever. I can't wait to go <laughs> back. Air conditioning, ice water. Getting your bill quick enough. The, uh, not paying for the bathroom. Not paying for the bathroom. Dude, I, I did a tap card to pay for a bathroom in Ireland. Hilarious. Um, you but, didn't bring me back a bottle of Jameson, and I'll dude, forever resent you for that. I, I'm sorry. It, it was honestly like really cool. I wasn't a big Jameson guy until I went there, and now I am. Now I, like, I learned more about it, the different types. And we brought one bottle back, but that's for uh, my girlfriend's dad. Sorry, but... We can we can make it you want. Um, one thing I did learn is we have much better budget airlines than the Europeans. If you uh, flew a uh, Welling, I think it's a Spanish airline, right? It is, uh, yeah. yeah. It's owned by the same company that owns Iberia. Not a good time. It was rough. Uh, not only, I mean, they have the same seats as like Spirit, but just I don't know. The whole experience was not fun, and I hate the busing to the airplane thing. No. And, I used to love that when I was a kid. Like, yeah, when you're a kid, awesome. I can see like it was like, oh, the big crap. airplane, you know. And yeah. Nowadays, it's like it's pouring rain in Frankfurt. I got to get off this airplane it's like at six thirty in the like, morning. Oh. Yeah, and the the stairs sway. Yeah, yeah no, it's uh, I appreciate spirit now. Uh, no oh, shade, wow. <laughs> no oh. shade to spirit. It was also weird. They're like today. selling like cologne, like in the middle of the flight too, like going oh, down duty the aisle. free stuff. Yeah, yeah, that was that was awkward. Um. So one company that makes you walk outside to jump on airplanes, Jet Suidex, and they're uh, 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 or JSX. JSX, call them sorry, yes. I, I'm back. I remember when they were Jet Suite and they had the I do too. Phenom 100s. Those I were pretty that. sweet. Um, mm-hmm. What's going on with them? FA cracked Gosh. down on that whole area, which I mean, it affects them and Aero and maybe SkyWest's it, it, new thing. Well, sure, it's, and the SkyWest charter is spinoff kind of sparked all this right um it's so complicated to get into the weeds about how part 380 works on the economic side and part 135 but it all boils down to kind of public charters which operate well, let me preface this. some would say it op- they operate like airlines where they have scheduled operations and they do i mean they have scheduled flight times they leave from um quote-unquote terminals even though they're fbos um and this also, you know, there's a strong argument to be made here. And I would even kind of lean towards that argument myself that this is sort of a, a big airline move by both Southwest and American. Um, when they started to see JSX really encroach on their market share in their home base, which is Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, obviously, Southwest and American are both headquartered there, have enormous operations there. And now JSX is also headquartered in Dallas and has their largest operations at Love Field. And so I think the airlines saw this as, okay, well, we can't compete with them. So we're going to go to Washington and do what we do best and lobby. And it uh, seemed to work because the FAA this week announced that they would be uh, passing through the new regulation to close that so-called loophole um, uh, that allows these public charter flights to operate. Now, Aero, JSX are obviously the big names here, right? And those are the ones that people keep kind of bringing up. But there's others, too. There's there's Contour, which operates an enormous amount of essential air service um, to small towns that you haven't even heard of across the country. Now, for Contour, I don't know if it'll be much of an impact as it is for some of these others, just because they already operate to and from terminals um, because they operate feeder flights. So you'll see them, you know, at your local airport terminal um so they already ha- they're already doing that they don't need to go find gate space um passengers go through security like anybody else yeah yeah yada, yada, yada. it's the same same setup jsx though that's very different and so far 
SpaceX is kind of seemed a little, you know, mum about how this will play out. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I, what is the reasoning that the FAA is giving other than like it's a legal thing that we have to close? Like, is there like a public good? Is there a safety well, and that's, issue? Or? And that's the thing. I mean, of course, they're bringing in the safety point of, you know, you operate as a scheduled operator under Part 121, there's a, a significant uh, difference in how your structure works, right? And and uh, it can, I mean, it's everything from um, aircraft maintenance to flight training to, um, you know, onboard layout. I mean, there's, it's it's a very different world. And the AFA is, of course, pulling the safety guard, but the NBAA kind of snapped back. And for those that don't know who the NBAA B double is they're the, the sort of the association behind business aircraft owners, and um, they said, "Well, where is the data? Like, why isn't there a data driven approach here?" Um, and you know, there isn't really any evidence to suggest that public charter operations are more unsafe than a traditional Part One Twenty One carrier. Uh, I'm not really sure how you track that, but um, so it's it's definitely quite an interesting time. Where do, they, where do they do their training? Do they do it through flight safety or do they have their own facility? For... I think they do it. They outsource it out to um, to a sim farm like flight safety or somebody like that. Got it. Yeah, I'm just like looking over like a job posting for like pilots here at JSX. I, there's no real red flags here. I mean, I think like, and it's probably going to be an unpopular opinion. The only red flag is you can fly past 65 like sure like that's but any the, part 135 carrier you can do yeah, it, right? yeah for not, sure. not even a three uh public charter i mean and, so they got net jets you're saying yeah and you still have to get your you still have to get your medical i mean like you know there's yeah. no it, well that's a whole that's a whole, all we can go around right, yeah. <laughs> yeah but the the part of the reason that i think a lot of people failed to kind of realize during um the whole age 65 debate in congress uh, it was that there's an international standard set forth by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, that sets the retirement age as 65. That age has not been updated yet in a long time to be to be raised, and there are some countries that deviate from it. Japan does, Australia does, um, but the problem becomes then you have pilots who are at the top of that uh, seniority list who are stuck, then have to be sort of displaced to a domestic operation, right? Because they can't fly to other countries where that age is is uh, not compliant with ICAO standards. So that's kind of the problem here on the 121 side. But on the 135 side, that doesn't really matter because they're not operating as an airline. So sticking with like the operational side of this, do JSX passengers go through TSA? JSX, just like many other uh, public charter operators have, have a TSA plan on file with the agency, um, which includes, as far as I, I'm pretty sure, which includes running names, passenger info through the secure flight database, just like any airline would. Um, so they won't board somebody who's on the watch list, essentially is what that means. Um, JSX does have in their terminals a very basic security screening process, um, but it's you know, nowhere near uh, what you'd find at a TSA checkpoint. I think... Yeah, I mean, there's no real safety issues that have popped up. Um, I know, like, like Surf Air and, like, Tradewind up in the Northeast, they, I mean, they have pilots that are just, like, fresh commercial, like, single-engine commercial pilots. And, you know, no real issue there. I think lately it's been pretty well regulated, like, rest times, you know, properly staffed. And, I, I mean, you can point to the early crashes in the 2000s with the regional airlines with fatigue and all that but i think lately we've been pretty good so i think the safety argument's kind of crap i mean what are we doing um the one thing you talked about before was small markets being affected by this can you expand on that okay so let's talk the business case for small community or service there's something called unit cost in the airline industry that's measured by chasms cost per available seat mile and so you have the smaller the aircraft you have, essentially, generally, the higher the unit cost can be. So if you're sending a 50-seat CRJ200 to a small community that may or may not be subsidized now, 
especially with labor costs being much higher than what they were before COVID, that unit cost is substantially higher and you have less ability to offset that with premium revenue or uh, a, a di- just having additional seats to offset it. So uh, you s- run into the situation now where, yes, SkyWest Charters has popped up and Contour in some ways has popped up um, to go out and serve these communities, but be able to do it without you don't need the same amount of hours you would need to operate part 121. And so therefore that labor cost component is a bit less. And the other part 121 costly components that you would need to serve that community are also less. So, yeah. So in a nutshell, it has, it does have some ramifications there for, for contour and, and SkyWest Charters, which is kind of in its infancy, so not really that big of a deal. Um, uh, when it comes to you know small communities, because that unit cost component coupled with um, pilot hours component is is substantial. And you know, I think now that I say contour, everybody here is going to be like, "Oh, I've seen that in my local airport before." Yeah. No, I've I- always wondered what that airport. Is. Oh, it's this. Um, yeah. I make fun of JSX a lot, like these airlines, not because of like the concept, but because don't of call the, them an airline though. They're, they're, they're not. These, these operators, sorry. Uh, see, there's the problem. I'm part of the problem. Um, not because of the actual operation, but because of the people flying it. I think it's just funny how they treat it uh, as like a private jet. I do think though that like you, there's an argument here that the airlines are trying to monopolize like a certain market. And like maybe that's the way out of this is you know going through the FTC, not FA, which is weird. Um, but I think it's only the premium market. Like, have you seen like a one way on JSX? Yeah, I mean, true, it's expensive, so expensive. But (laughs) but again, it's about the same as a first class fare. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. The premium market, right? Where you're going for yeah, but that. Um, But again. The, the the major airlines cannot compete with this product and they're sitting there and they know it now dude i don't know like united has leaned into it where they're like hey you can use yeah. you can earn mileage plus so or JetBlue. use your points at, on jsx like and that's remember, the way to do it is like i mean i'm a united guy for now and it's it's awesome that i have that option that like you know i'm gonna be flying out of denver like 99 percent of the time but maybe i'll go out of rocky mountain metro to go to dallas to go see you for something um and using jsx but united also has put a strong emphasis in the past couple of years on premium revenue right and this fits into that portfolio of attracting premium revenue and i'm sorry but american and southwest have not done that they don't they've not seen premium revenue as as kind of being in their uh you know kind of operating goals per se i and, mean American has has one of the worst lounges and first classes ever been in. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Southwest, I think like I don't think that's ever going to be their goal. I think American no. has has a angle there, but Southwest is that's just not them. You can't you can't compete with them, and they know it. And and to, you know, speaking from a former airline business guy here, you know, I sit you know you're probably sitting there looking at this looking at JSX encroachment in, in Dallas, for example, you're probably not sweating too much, but you don't want to sweat. So you're going to do whatever you can to unleash your lobbyists in Washington, and that's what's going to go. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how... I mean, I guarantee this is happening behind the scenes where, like, you know, these operators, JSX, Aero, and BAA are talking and trying to come up with a plan. What's the timeline for the FAA to to uh enact that happen at any time at this point they put the um they put the change out for comment several months ago now they got over uh it's almost sixty thousand comments i believe so that's a do lot do you know what the sentiment yeah. is with that can we it's hard that? to tell it, yeah. yeah well you can find the comments if you go to regulations.gov um, okay. but they're all i mean you have to download each pdf so if you want a fun saturday afternoon activity go to regulations.gov and download a bunch of public comments yeah, I mean, it sucks, but you know, we'll we'll see how it plays out, and it'll be. I don't think this is the end of it. I think it'll be like a long battle. This episode of Inside Aviation is sponsored by Ethereum. 
Athir is the market leader in health technology and oxygen systems for general aviation, offering certified and experimental hypoxia mitigation solutions, including integrated carbon monoxide monitoring, haptic safety wearables, built-in on-demand oxygen conserving systems, and the only oxygen concentrator optimized for unpressurized flight. To learn more about Ethereum and how to enhance your flight safety, visit www.ethereaviation.com. Buy any AVI on-demand oxygen system or any turbo oxygen maker system and get one free Allerian 2 haptic oximeter and safety wearable. Use code Inside Aviation at checkout. What's going on with Boeing's Cong- Congress hearing? And like, is was there anything of value that came out of it outside of the CEO just getting absolutely roasted? Not really. I mean, it, he stood up and turned to the victims of the Civil Service Max crash several years ago and sort of apologized and reiterated some of the talking points that Boeing's used over the years for that. But we'll play the clip here. Uh, but he he did kind of get it uh, from several senators um, who had a lot of questions for him about Boeing. And, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think Calhoun... CEO Boeing probably did what he could do at this point, which is just kind of try his best to answer the questions as well as he could. In the there was some dancing around some questions and take ownership because at this point that's what needs to be done. And it seems like that's what he did. So that made me some progress, but I'm not I'm not super confident uh, that that's going to make a meaningful difference. I mean. Congressional hearings, I think we can all say, are kind of just for show and for sound bites. I think well, for sure. I mean, come on now. Like, yeah, that's you don't you don't need to look very far to realize that those are. Yeah, nothing gets done there. Is there anything like actually happening, like on the ground outside of the FAA, putting more inspectors at Boeing, or I mean, are, we just, hard... are we just waiting for the next thing to happen to then investigate them again? Like, I mean, I think Boeing is is doubled down on putting additional quality checks in place, which is what they said they've done. Um, of course, they're in talks to buy Spirit Aero Systems. They're basically buying it back because they used to own the Wichita property where they're at. They have a North Carolina location too, right? Uh, I don't know. They're Spirit all over the place. Aero Systems. But, yeah. but yeah, so Boeing wants to buy them it's back. Easy. They're in talks to do that. Uh, it kind of puts that supply chain back in-house. So, you know, any person who does manufacturing supply chain would tell you that sometimes it's easier to control quality when it's all in-house. Um, so might be a step in the direction, might not, but I think the jury's still out on it. But uh, that decision has been made to initiate those talks, and it is happening, so we'll make it some progress. I mean, we'll, we'll see what goes on there. There's, I mean, there's more issues coming up every week with, with Boeing aircraft. Um, this one, though, not really their fault. Um, for now, as far as we know, the, uh, Southwest incidents that happened, you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, man. Yeah. So there's been two, um, again, they make, they always make headlines because they're pretty shocking. Uh, the first one was in Lahui, Hawaii, uh, one of the inner island flights from Honolulu. Uh, so there's a max eight, um, they were, they initiated to go around in poor weather conditions, um, and drifted down to about 400 feet over the Pacific ocean, uh, which is, you know, quite quite a bit of a deviation from the norm. Um, so there's that component. And then again, uh, in Oklahoma City, just, I don't know, 48 hours ago-ish, from the time we're taping here, um, another Southwest out there said so it was on a visual approach in Oklahoma City. Uh, it was a, some, there's an 800. And uh, they, they got a low altitude alert. The FAA confirmed, and you can find the recording online, that they issued a low altitude alert to them. They were around 500-ish feet, it looked like, based on ADSB data, AGL. Um, they went around, did the approach again, landed safely. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, I, I don't, I just don't speculate on stuff like this, but the first one, I will say that uh, flying into bad weather conditions into a very, very short runway, who is one of, probably one of the more challenging airports in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, there's a mountain on the other end of it, you know, it's, it's always been very complex. Yeah. That could have been like anything really. Um, I was thinking about it a bit more. It could have been a downdraft. It could have been like just trying yeah, to get I, more airspeed. Like, but I don't think the, like... it, I think, you know, you have to remember with airliners that, that go arounds are 
are very safe, very normal, very protected, um, you know, procedure, but, but you're also dealing with an airplane that's very light, right? Because it's the end of its flight. And these new airplanes now, the Maxes and the A320neos have an enormous amount of power. Um, they're, they do quite well in hot and high climates. And when you push those throttles to toga, um, it's going to move and it's going to move fast on you and it's going to be light and it's, you know, heard so anecdotally kind of from yeah. some 737 pilots that it can be kind of hairy because you're trying to get control of it and you're trying to get, you know, managing everything else at the same time, radios and, and it, and it, it's one of those situations where sure, you know, you, you just, you're kind of dealing with a lot, you're task saturated and, um, sure it's possible for that to be overlooked, uh, albeit not a great situation. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of these. And 500 this, feet over houses is so The second low. one. So the second one, actually, I was I was scrolling through a Facebook or aviation Facebook group this morning. Um, and I'd love comments. If there's anybody um, on our channel or watching us here that lives in Oak City, drop us a comment about this because I, I have... I thought this was really interesting is that there is a highway or a major road. I'm not sure if it's a highway that's directly like same heading as the runway that they were aligned with. And, oh no. And I, they were on a visual approach. It was a clear night. And I almost, I have, and somebody suggested that it is very possible that they may have mistaken it because it is a well-known fact that at nighttime flying a visual approach, can be quite challenging in, in larger areas. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the area. I've never flown in that, so it'd be interesting to like if somebody for sure like has flown in there or is from that area, if they can comment on that. But no, I'll tell you at night, flying at night, like there's been times where I'm like, dude, where is the airport? Like, yeah, well, like, <laughs> like I've humbly have had to ask before, like, hey, uh, where are you guys? Well, maybe just, you're, you're some European. Airlines, so, I mean, not even Europe, around the world, uh, restrict visual approaches at night. They don't let pilots do it. Yeah, I mean, it's especially like when you're like an airline and you're flying like, I mean, a visual in an airline is like at least like 10 miles, 10, 15 miles, which is like, dude, it's so hard to see an airport at night from 10, 15 miles. Like at three miles at night, it's like, all right, got it. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, I can see. I, I really want to get a comment from somebody in the area. Um, maybe we can flight sim it or something. But that's that's interesting. I didn't know that take. Um, any other insights from locals or, or anything that's, about that? That's what I read and I thought it was interesting. I mean, again, kind of goes back to visual approaches at night and how complicated sometimes they can be. Even though Oklahoma City is not, I mean, it's, it's not a large metropolitan area. It's not Dallas, Fort Worth. It's not you know, Phoenix, wherever, you know, insert major city here. So it's interesting, I, you know, but I'm sure it's still, you can still run into that same problem. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, before we totally leave the airline topic, what's going on with the American oh, Airlines yeah. flight attendants, man? So we've talked about this before on here, about the Railway Labor Act and why airline strikes in the U.S. are so rare. They happen all the time of year. Like one day you'll just wake up and they'll be on strike. But here, yo, it almost happened. Hold on, real, real quick. Um, when I was, we were thinking. So there's a new route from Denver to Dublin, Aer Lingus, like direct Dublin, back to Denver as well. They were like seven days away from a strike when we were there, and we're like, dang, we yeah. are so lucky. We we got united because like being stuck. I think it was like forty thousand passengers that were about to be stuck in a matter. Of, it's like, still going on right now. Oh, it is. There mm -hmm. you go. Yeah. Go check it out yeah, on my geeks. Yeah. Uh yeah, you can. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean so the Railway Labor Act, it goes back to nineteen twenty six. It is it was meant to uh sort of use mediation, federally backed mediation to let parties, unions and companies reach collective bargaining agreements, um, instead of using uh self help, so strikes or lockouts. Uh, and of course, that was meant to protect interstate commerce at the time. Uh, but that quickly changed in the 80s when they sort of changed some language in it to include airlines. And now uh, it's a very, very, very long process for a strike to even remotely happen. Um, 
last time there was a flight attendant strike uh, for a major airline was actually American in 1993. American was a much smaller airline than it then than it was today. Bill Clinton had to step in and sort of sort of I wouldn't say push the parties, but guide them into mediation or into arbitration. Um, and so now we're running into this point where yesterday the flight attendant said that uh, they have not reached an agreement. Um, and now it's kind of up to the National Mediation Board to decide what to do. Um, I would put a little money on that the National Mediation Board will have no choice but to proffer arbitration or but to release the party into a 30-day cooling off period, um, which can be done before a strike or a lockout takes place. Um, but of course, there's also the component here that uh, is always a political component that Biden could step in and call a presidential emergency board or uh, he could step in and kind of, you know, broker a deal per se. Um, I'm not sure how that'll play out because Biden is obviously a very pro-union guy, very pro-union president. Um, so I'm very curious to see what the White House will do here. Um, is it's looking each day more and more like they're going to have to do something at some point. Did you remember you have these scales here, right? Uh, the political scales you have. On one hand, if you allow the strike to take place, even for one day, it would, and the world's largest airline, I mean, it would significantly hamper interstate commerce. Uh, not even it's a global commerce. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have your, it's an election year and you, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. So very interesting, very curious to see kind of what happens. Yeah, that will be fun to like, monkey monitor. I mean, not fun, but it'll be a good one to keep track of lots of stuff going on. Um, all right. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Inside Aviation. This episode was also sponsored by the Midwest Model Store. Midwest Model Store is one of the fastest growing online retailers for commercial airline models. And actually, they have some GA airline models as well and uh, some military ones that are actually really cool. If you use code INSIDE AVIATION, all caps INSIDE AVIATION, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. Check it out. I have a 777 here. They're actually super detailed. I don't know if you got one, Ryan. Um, I do. They're all behind my head. Here. They're awesome. They're like they are. really cool. Um, I didn't think they'd be like this. You they know, also got some cool fighters on and, there too. So. Yeah, the fighters are awesome. Um, go check them out. But otherwise, support us. Sign up for our newsletters, Airline Geeks, Avweb, Kit Plans, all the different journals on Fire Crown. Become a subscriber, Flying Magazine, Plane and Pilot, um, everything else. But uh, if you have any comments, concerns, or anything, or me looking at my phone, email us at insideaviation at firecrown.com. Woo!